paper. And so the idea was that the the particles would bounce in between them. And that worked and they got hotter and hotter and hotter. But guess what? As you kind of would imagine, as this mirror topology, this linear topology, the pressure increased inside the, the particle pressure, the, the particles tried to push back on the magnetic field. They're trying to escape now. They're trying, they're getting hotter and hotter. And just as you imagine, hot mm -hmm. gas in a balloon tries to get out the ends and you could not hold it tight enough at the ends to keep those particles in. And in fact, the problem is the hottest ones were the ones that would escape. Mm -hmm. And so you do a good job of heating it and they'd all leave out the ends. Okay. So then the next iteration has said, okay, well, why don't we just not try to hold on to it very long? Why don't we squeeze it? And so rather than just holding it constantly, let's now crush it. So we built the solenoid, we pinched the ends, and then we crushed it. And when, what I mean by crushing it is not actually like crushing any magnets or changing the, the, the topology or, or moving any parts, but just rapidly increasing the magnetic field. And so going from a magnetic field that's just holding it to now taking all those particles, if you imagine they were in a, a, a streaming around together and then rapidly increasing the magnetic field so that those particles get closer and closer and closer together. So you increase the density. And now fusion starts to really happen. But they ended up hitting a technological limit. So this is the part that, that um, I look back and I'm, I look at the pioneers that in 1958, there was some... I mean, this is wild, man. This is it, man. <laughs> this, this is it, chat. I am getting goosebumps listening to this because we have figured it out, man. This is the big secret. The big secret is fusion and what fusion is actually capable of. And he says, we know what we have to do. We knew the answer. We know the answer. What's holding us back right now? We have the math and the equations right in front of us. And it says right there that the pressure is going to be equal to the B squared divided by two uh, times the electric permittivity or permeability of or the magnetic permeability of free space. There it is right there. There's the answer. We don't have the material science. That was the thing that was holding us back in the 50s. It was a long time ago. We didn't have the material science we do now. So when did it get figured out? If somebody were to ask me or to ask you, Ashton, MH370 Orby out there, when did it get figured out? You don't give them a date. You don't give them a date. You say... We figured it out the moment we were able to develop magnetic electromagnets that were powerful enough. When did that happen? Maybe in the 90s. My guess, if I have to guess, computers, we needed computers that were powerful enough. Yes, person in the chat, we need computers. And we needed super powerful electromagnets. And we got those electromagnets in the form of YBCO superconductors. Who's famous for those? Oh, Ning Li and Eugene Popkinov are famous for their YBCO superconductors. The high temperature superconductors, yidium, barium, copper oxide. Now, I'm sure we have other options as well. I mean, that was 30 years ago. But the moment that our material science took off, we had this figured out. And who would be the first person then? If now we know the parameters, the, the physics was figured out in the 50s. The material science needed to catch up. We know it got figured out when the material science got figured out. Who would have been the first person to figure out which groups would have figured out the material science first? It's going to be the United States government. It's going to be Lockheed Martin and the companies that came before Lockheed Martin, the Boeing. It's going to be Boeing. It's going to be Raytheon. It's going to be General Atomics. It's going to be all of these companies. The defense contractors are the ones that figured it out first. That's why Lockheed Martin with their compact fusion reactor, that should be setting off red flags and warning bells, alarm bells for everybody. The moment Lockheed Martin came out and basically copied what Helium Fusion was doing, literally just copied what they were doing. They didn't even say it because they probably didn't want to get sued. It's pretty obvious when Charles Chase says, we're making something with a high beta value. We know exactly what they're doing. You're making something with a high beta value. You're using a field reverse configuration. We know what you were doing. You were doing the same thing that Helium Fusion is talking about. And they're talking about having it not be externally confined. They're talking about the plasma itself is doing the confinement. And in uh, millionths of a second, microseconds, megahertz speeds. Um, and this was in 1958. No transistor, no CPUs, and, um, and no electrical switches, none of the things that I take for granted every day. And so they were able to show at that time the highest performing fusion systems. Um, they got to temperatures. They didn't get to 100 million degrees. Not quite then. They got to 50 million degrees. They were outperforming everything else in fusion. But they reached a technical million. limit where they just could not build it anymore. 
And so they, th those pioneers, went in a different direction. And they started down the laser inertial path of saying like, okay, well, we can't do these uh, electromagnetic pinches, but we now have this new thing has invented the laser, which turns on in a nanosecond. It's mm -hmm. fast. It's interesting. Let's go down that path. Um, and it's not, you have to fast forward a couple of decades to researchers found with some of these theta pinches when they're operated in a very specific way, something else happened, something new happened. And that these plasmas where before they squeezed them very hard and just like squeezing a tube of toothpaste, they squirted out the ends. Now it didn't squirt out the ends. It actually pushed back. It stayed confined. It stayed trapped inside that linear topology. Even though the ends were open, the plasma didn't leave. And so there was a large amount of programs of like, what is happening here? This is an accidental discovery in plasma physics that something new is happening. And what we discovered is we now call the field reverse configuration. O M. Pause chat, galaxy class, pause chat. What? They were messing around with theta pinches, trying to get the plasma to be to act right. And all of a sudden, it just started stabilizing. It just started self-organizing is basically what he just said. They discovered a new property about plasma where it started he said the, the the doors were still open and the plasma just chose not to go out them the plasma just didn't want to go out and they decided to call this brand new this brand new discovery of plasma what did they call it chat field reverse configuration boom baby Hmm. we were right ashton forbes was right get the apology form start printing out the apology forms we're gonna need stacks of apology forms chat mh370 cold fusion literally blowing the lid off of cool fusion like five years before it even happens chat just get the apology forms ready I, I got all the people's Twitter posts saying how much of a dickhead, a hoaxer, a scammer I am. Someday in the future, we're going to have the greatest day ever when everybody has to acknowledge that MH370X was right the whole time. We're going to just have a live stream for 12 hours straight. We're just going to go through all the people's posts, all the douchebags, all the idiots talking crap. It's going to be amazing. Okay. Uh, there's numerous programs of... FRC, field reverse configuration programs on um, both at national labs. There's actually a number of private companies now of people building field reverse configurations. Um, and they have some really unique properties. But fundamentally, talking about the main difference, I described a solenoid with magnetic fields throughout the center of that volume and plasma trapped. <laughs> By the way, that graphic right here, if you're listening on audio, it's a graphic of two rings with like stuff spinning around in the middle. This looks just like the images of Lockheed Martin's compact fusion reactor. reactor. <laughs> like literally, it's just a series of concentric rings of different sizes that's it there i mean you're basically looking at the graphic going back and forth but some other things can happen which is really interesting and what they discovered early is if they have field going in one direction so the plasma the uh, electrical current is going around the loop and the plasma is going back and forth along this magnetic field line inside that solenoid inside that theta bench but then they change the direction of the magnetic field and this is what we call field reversal and this is really the key is that you start with the plasma going in one direction and then very rapidly you change the direction you change the direction and reverse the direction of that field and something really interesting happens which is the plasma this, fu this fusion fuel these charged particles which are trapped on the magnetic field lines um, um, that are moving back and forth, you change the direction. What that means is that there you're trying to take that electrical current and that magnetic field and reverse its direction, flip it, and but can't flip fast enough. That the plasma is sitting there and you can't move the particles. And so what's really interesting is what happens is that because the particles can't move, but you've now flipped the direction of the magnetic field, you've, you've inverted it, something really, really unique happens, which is that the plasma itself can reconnects internally. And so now what you're left with is an outside magnetic field, an electrical coil, and inside the plasma, where now it was before it was moving along, it's now moving internally, rapidly reversing the magnetic field. Wow, chat. Do you guys? <laughs> when I heard that, man, I was just like, wow, direct connection to free energy right there. How do you guys think free energy works in a magnetic motor? How do you guys think that it works? Right. When we talked about parametric uh, amplification uh, of oscillations of electrical energy, how we're going to produce free energy is we're going to use the the back uh, EMF, the collapse of the magnetic field. So you build your magnetic field up and then your magnetic field collapses. 
And electricity flows when there's a changing magnetic field. So the idea is that why does a pulse matter? Well, when you're pulsing, you're pulsing on and off your magnetic field. You're pulsing it on or off. This idea of pulsing the magnetic field strength, if that same concept, that's the same exact concept that we were using like for uh, Bendini motors, the same concept that we were using for serial uh, magnetic motors is the same thing that we're using for our plasma reactor. We're using the same physics for free energy devices that we are using in our plasma reactor, fusion reactor. That tells me even more that what we're talking about when it comes to free energy really is some fundamental aspect of the universe that people have found how to tap into in multiple different ways. Whether that be from an electromagnetic motor or a, sorry, a magnetic motor uh, that can tap into zero point energy from using these types of oscillations and amplification or directly going to the source, which in my opinion is plasma fusion. And yes, how do you allow free energy? So the thing that I'm doing here is I am turning this topic, call it what you will, zero point energy, a neutron fusion, turning this into a political discussion, turning it into a political topic. People don't want to talk about it, but I'm going to turn it into one because it needs to be discussed. All the implications of what this means need to be discussed. I talk about them with Jason Giorgiani. I think that's the biggest thing that we need to talk about is how do you implement free energy and what how what safeguards do you put into place or we only get the nerfed version of it when do we get to teleport throughout the universe right these are the big questions that i think should be asked when is it going to be safe how much do we really know compared to what they're telling us okay here we go field plasma self-organizes into a closed field mm -hmm what yep <laughs> so how, it, it sounds wild it's it's, it's yeah it's, so first of all there's a lot of there's a million questions i have mm -hmm. but one of them what's rapidly what time scale are we talking about here mm -hmm. you have to reverse the electrical current faster than a million degree which is a very hot gas particle can move and so that means we have to do it on the order of a millionth of a second wow. we have to do it in a millionth of a second wow and so you just think about it. what did i just say you're abusing the collapse of the electromagnetic field strength here so how how do you get that to work you have to make the collapse happen the time scale has to be faster than the electrons themselves. What does that mean? That means they have to be relativistic. We're dealing with relativistic implications here. It's exactly what he's implying right here. He's saying you need that pulse to be so fast that the magnetic field can't even collapse faster than that. So that when the electron turns around, now it's bumping back against the electromagnetic field that it created. So now this is very similar to the core concept of vibrating the walls on our magnetic, uh, our plasma mirror to make a relativistic electron laser. The same thing that was being discussed by Paul Thibodeau when he talked about the drift velocity of graphene. Why are all these things connected? Because it all goes back to the electron, how fast the electron is moving and then having relativistic motion. So if I go left and you go right, then our combined relativistic motion is the speed combined. Add the speeds up. That also applies even on small scales, even on tiny scales that applies. And this is why my view of the universe, that there's nothing that's ever really stopped. I'm going to go on one quick tangent here. Uh, the answer to the Hal Pudoff question of, or I I've now know what the counter response is when Hal Pudoff says the ground state of the hydrogen atom is should be radiating energy all the time because there's an electron and this electron is moving around the nucleus. So in a conventional view of our atom, the electron should be radiating energy. It's moving. Anything that's moving should radiate energy. Otherwise, it's a perpetual motion machine. The second law of thermodynamics says anything that's moving should lose a little bit of energy. So the electron should eventually crash into the nucleus, but it doesn't. And so Hal Pudoff says that electron must be gaining energy from the zero point energy field. There must be another source of energy for that electron to stay stable. The classical view, the counter view is that they believe that at the quantum level, nothing is moving. It's all stopped. It's all frozen. 
to me, that's the easiest thing to disprove. Easy to disprove. The fundamental rule of quantum mechanics is that nothing is stopped. It's the exact opposite of that. <laughs> the truth of quantum mechanics is the exact opposite. That if we look at the smallest scales, everything is jiggling. That's why we call it the Zitra gong. So this is the difference. This is where I now know where quantum mechanics went wrong. Now it all makes sense. Quantum mechanics went wrong when it started trying to talk about breaking down the wave function, collapsing the wave function. Started getting going wrong when it thought about, well, we're going to freeze this moment in time as opposed to addressing the physical realities of the experiments that we were getting the responses for, as opposed to reconciling what we already knew about quantum mechanics. The pendulum is never stopped. The pendulum is never stopped in quantum mechanics. So hopefully that helped you guys get a little bit more context. Let's listen to a little bit more Lex Friedman. And so in practice, <laughs> this is hard. Yeah. And it's only, we can only do it now because of semiconductor switching. Mm -hmm. Because we can, we can move things, we can switch things like the transistor in every CPU and a computer switches at a gigahertz. That means in a nanosecond, it's switching in a billionth of a second. And so now, which we didn't in the 1950s when these theta pinches were invented, but now we have the semiconductors to be able to do that. The self-organizing plasma, mm -hmm. can you just speak to that? What the heck is it doing? How do we discover, how do we understand the self-organizing mechanism, the dynamics of the plasma that is able to contain itself? So what I like to do is use an analogy here of once you've made it, it's actually somewhat straightforward to understand. Getting to it is tricky. And how they discovered it the first time is absolutely amazing. But once you've made it, it's a lot, it's a lot more straightforward to understand. So in a magnetic coil, when you have an, a round electrical coil, you have electrical current flowing in that coil. And if you have a conductor, if you have another a metal inside that coil, and this is called Lenz's law in one of the Maxwell equations, is that as you have electrons and you have current flowing in that coil, an equal and opposite electrical current is induced in a piece of metal nearby. This is the same thing that happens in a transformer, uh, where you have a primary on a transformer and you have electricity flowing it, and you have a secondary where electricity flows exactly the opposite direction. We use this every day in, in, in our lives. Hmm. And so in this in condition, you have a conductor, an electrical conductor where current can flow, and you have an electrical current flowing on the outside, electrical current flows on the inside. Um, and in that case, now you, I, I've described two pieces of metal. Now let's go one step further, and that inner conductor is not a piece of metal anymore. It's one of these high temperature gases, this plasma, this charged particles. So now you have current, electrical current flowing in the plasma. This is really, really interesting. We talked about these charges moving back and forth. Well, moving electrical charges is current. So in every plasma condition we've talked about, the tokamak, um, the theta pinch, the stellarator, there's electrical current flowing in the plasma. But in the field reverse configuration, you have a lot of electrical current flowing in the plasma, massive amount. So now what he's saying here is that our plasma that we're producing, it's got a huge amount of current flowing through it. Because what is electricity? Electricity is technically just electrons moving. And that's definitely happening in our plasma when our plasma is moving around. So it's going to produce its own elect it's going to produce its own magnetic field because of the current that it's producing. So what we're talking about here is that we're just we're figuring out how to use plasma to produce energy in the most efficient possible way. That's really all that's really all it boils down to. And that's the key.